So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this lunchtime uh, for a webinar. Um, so it's part of the Rediscovering the River Colne programme, um, which is started by Watford Borough Council. Um, it's a 10-year programme um, with three years of community engagement, which is where myself and my colleague Andrew come in. Um, and we've been working on different webinars, different areas um, to improve the relationship between people and the River Colne in Watford especially, um, including wellbeing sessions, environmental monitoring, um, and working with various groups such as the Environment Agency today. Um, so that is why we're here today and hopefully you'll find this uh, very informative and interesting um, lead you on to further um, involvement in events. Uh, Curve the next slide please, Maria. So just a few house rules to begin with. Um, please remain on mute um, during the presentation um, so we don't hear any washing machines, some dogs barking in the background, so it flows nicely for Maria what she's presenting. Um, any questions that you have, please save it for the end. Um, and if you think you'll forget, please add it to the chat, chat function and then we can come back to it at the end after Maria's presented. Um, and as I said before, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Maria to start the presentation. Uh, uh, hello, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so yeah, I'm Maria Bailey. Um, I am from the Environment Agency. I am the Biodiversity Officer covering the, the Colm catchment. Um, so that includes the River Colm through, through Watford. Um, hopefully you don't hear any dogs or washing machines on my end, but you can hopefully hear me clearly instead. Um, so I guess a um, bit about me. Yeah, so I've been with the Environment Agency for a, for a couple of years now, um, specifically in this team for uh, it's about three years, I think it is. Um, and I've kind of been working on some of the like, restoration projects in the area. Um, but also giving advice on sort of uh, river management, um, which includes a little bit on invasive species that we find. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the, without further ado, I guess we may as well jump straight in. Um, if it works, there we go. Um, so I always like to start think, thinking about when I talk about invasive species, I like to think about, first of all, um, strip it all the way back, what is um, a native species? Um, and to, to think about native species, we have to think about um, where, where do they all come from? Um, so native species are those that we consider to be resident on the island that is now the UK and England um, at the time when um, we were still connected to continental Europe. Um, at the end of the last ice age. Um, so when, when the ice age ended, there was lots of glacial and ice melt, the sea levels rose, and we were suddenly disconnected from, from continental Europe. So native species are all those species that were found at that time. Um, they didn't get there by accident. They were already there. And there was no interference from humans, um, and they are our native species. Um, so since then, a lot has happened since 10,000 years ago, um, and kind of pretty much everything that has arrived since we kind of think of as a non-native species. Um, and most of those have actually just naturalised, they fit into our environment really well, we don't really notice that they're there, they don't cause damage. Um, they might have arrived naturally, so through the wind, through the tides, they might have flown or swum. Um, but they could also have arrived accidentally, so you find mussels arriving on, on the hulls of ships. Um, we might have introduced some species, so um, crop species in particular. They're not native, but we don't really have an issue with them. Um, and so following, uh, so, so just as a kind of a, a fun fact, um, it's estimated that around 50% of plant species, 25% of reptiles, 12% of birds, and 30% of mammals in the UK are non-native. That's quite a lot, um, but they're not a problem. Um, the ones that are a problem are the invasive non-native species. 
Um, and so these are the, the species that they, they spread, um, but they also cause damage or harm. Um, and that could be e ecologically, financially, socially. Um, uh, and so those, those are the ones we're interested in today. Um, and just to get an idea, uh, the, of all the species that are imported to the UK, only around 10% of those end up in the wild. Um, and of those, only about 10% again of those that appear in the wild are ones that cause the significant impact. Um, we find that aquatic species tend to be more invasive than terrestrial ones. Um, and we find that animal species tend to be more invasive than plants. Um, and that's really just because of their ability to spread. It's really hard to predict which species have the potential to be invasive. Um, and so we're constantly on the lookout for, for those kind of species. <clears throat> so as I said, um, the impacts of invasives vary greatly. Um, the, they can have lots of different impacts. So uh, the one that I think is probably closest to a lot of people's hearts is, is their environmental impact. Um, they often outcompete the native species. Um, they can spread disease. They interfere with the genetic integrity of, of the, the native species. 40% um, of all the endangered species in the world are threatened due to invasive non-native species. Another impact that we find is um, that econ econ economically, um, they cost a lot of money. Um, so a report by CABI, who are a not-for-profit kind of research organization, um, in 2010, they found that invasive non-native species cost the British economy about 1.7 billion pounds a year. That's obviously a lot. Um, we are now 12 years on from that report. Um, so taking into account inflation, um, it's likely that the cost of invasive non-natives is probably around 2.2 billion pounds a year to the British economy. So yeah, they, they, they cost a lot of money. Um, they can also cause a lot of um, harm uh, socially. So you might have in, uh, issues with them causing impacts to human health. Um, they might be a nuisance species for landowners. Um, an example of a social impact includes um, something like the Asian hornet, which um, we now do have recorded in the UK. Um, but in France, since its introduction, the Asian hornet has actually killed at least seven people um, through bad reactions to their sting. So there's lots of different impacts. Um, particularly impactful on our freshwater system. So the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment stated that the introduction of non-native invasive species is one of the major causes of species extinction in freshwater systems. Sadly, in, in our area, in my area, Hoxton, North London, um, we have a lot of invasive species um, that continue to inhabit the area, um, especially in the Colne Valley. Um, and they range from grey squirrels to European mink to quagga mussels, top, top mouth gudgeon, signal crayfish, um, the list is fairly long. Um, I'm, today I'm just going to cover about three of those, um, well three of the most commonly spotted plant species that you would possibly see through um, the River Colne and Watford. I'll talk a bit about where they've come from, their sort of identification features, uh, the harm that they cause, and then a bit about how they can be managed. We'll also cover a little bit on the legislation that applies, um, and then some of the challenges for managing them, but what you can do to help. So, the first species that I think you might recognise um, is Himalayan balsam. And it's commonly seen along lots of different rivers, um, but also definitely seen in the River Colne. This species was introduced in 1839. Um, it was uh, introduced by the Victorians as a, a garden ornamental. Um, and as you might guess from the name, it's come from the Himalayas. It was first recorded in the wild um, about 15 years later in 1855, and it quite quickly spread across Europe. Um, where people really 
actually really liked, admired it, really liked it, the, the flowers, um, and it was actually a good source of nectar for lots of for bees. Um, so the key features of, uh, of Himalayan balsam, um, those pink flowers, uh, they, the, the colour can actually range quite a lot from very pale um, to a really deep pink colour. Um, and that shape is really characteristic, it's like a bonnet, and it produces a really large amount of pollen um, that's really attractive to pollinating inse insects. Um, it forms a monoculture, um, so it, it, there's just one species within an area and it, it can grow really tall. It's actually got the, the accolade of Europe's tallest annual plant. Um, so those seed pods, you might have seen David Attenborough's Green Planet recently. Um, where he showed off the exploding seed pods. Um, and those, <laughs> those seed pods can spread seeds up to four meters away from an individual plant. You can imagine that they spread pretty quickly. Uh, we actually have several varieties um, or st strands of, of um, Himalayan balsam within the UK, and that just relates from whereabouts in the Himalayas it was introduced from. You typically find it along riverbanks, but it can also <coughs> excuse me, it can also be found in anywhere vaguely damp. Um, it likes wet woodlands, it likes damp grasslands, scrubby areas, wastelands. Um, it's a really shade tolerant species, so it's really adaptive to lots of environments. Um, it can sometimes be really tall, it can sometimes be a lot smaller. Um, it's not very drought resistant, so actually in, in sort of 2018, when we had those really high temperatures, we found that Himalayan and Bolson was looking a bit sad um, and uh, it, it does rely on having that dampness in the, in the soil. Um, the Latin name of Himalayan and Bolson, it literally means the impatient plant bearing glands. Um, so impatiens, impatient, uh, referring to how quickly the seeds disperse, glandular, gland, sera, to bear. Um, so, yeah, I think it was very well described. <laughs> uh, so what, what are the impacts of this plant? Why is it a problem? Um, so as an annual plant, uh, Himalayan balsam is killed off by frost in the autumn. Um, it dies back. Um, and so those monocultures that I talked about leave the riverbanks exposed to erosion. Uh, this leads to increased sediment entering the watercourse. Um, which in turn impacts on the water quality um, and the water chemistry. So that increased sediment uh, increases the turbidity of, of the water. Um, and that in turn impacts on the dissolved oxygen levels, which are really important for species survival. So those oxygen levels drop, um, which causes issues for fish, causes issues for invertebrates. Um, and that increased sediment load actually has to potential to uh, smother the fish eggs um, and also the feeding parts of lots of invertebrates. So just through having that bare bank, um, there is the potential that the composition of habitat within the river um, completely changes. It makes it unsuitable for lots of the characteristic species that we might expect in our rivers that disrupt the food chain. So it's quite bad impact environmentally. Um, on top of that, um, the flowers themselves, the Himalayan balsam flowers, are highly attractive to pollinating insects. They have a really high source of nectar in them. Um, and this actually excludes insects from visiting native plants. And so it excludes them from pollination and thus the, their viable seeds of native plants uh, reduces. So there's one way to think about this. If you imagine that you're visiting a superstore for all of your everyday needs. You just go to the seaport, so you find everything, you go home. Um, that's what it's like visiting Himalayan balsam. It's got everything you need. Um, with native plants, it's not such a high sugar content. It's not such a sugar rush when you visit. It's a bit more like uh, if you step back in time and you wanted to visit all those independent little shops to get everything you need. Um, you have to shop around to, to get everything. And so this means that Insects uh, like us are a bit lazy. They prefer to go to the superstore 
Um, so they get that strong nectar source in one go and the native plants lose out. So it's kind of like a, a, a positive um, reinforcement reaction because you have this monoculture of, in, of Himalayan balsam. Um, so there are less native plants around in the first place, but the insects prefer to keep going back to that monoculture of Himalayan balsam. They ignore the native plant, and so you get more and more balsam and less and less native plants. So not great news for our environment. Um, luckily, managing this species is actually relatively simple, although it is quite labour intensive. Um, it's really easy. You, you can pull this plant up by hand. The root system is really shallow. Um, you can get it all in one go. Um, equally, you can cut it back so that you cut the stems to below the first node on the stem, and that will stop it from growing. If you're doing any of this kind of management, you should be doing it before there are any flowers present. Um, so just make sure that you're not spreading any seeds and you're disturbing the, the plant. Um, this has to be repeated yearly, sometimes several times a year, just to make sure that you're getting every single plant um, and you're depleting the seed bank in the soil. Um, so eventually there are no seeds and there are no new plants. Um, so obviously vigilance is really important to make sure there's no further invasion. Um, another um, option for controlling this species is called a biocontrol, um, a short for biological control. And essentially a biological control is using another living organism, such as an insect or a pathogen, um, to control the pest population um, of, of what, uh, what is invasive. So um, it kind of levels the playing field by reintroducing some natural um, predators to that invasive species. Um, it kind of uh, balances out um, um, the, the competition um, and makes sure that the invasive species can't take over in a way that it would without the control. So if Emily and Bolson, that control is rust fungus. Um, and that rust fungus has been under research since 2006. It was approved by DEFRA for release into the field in 2014. And it was actually the first fungal control um, in, in, in the whole of the EU. It's been, so it's been trialled in the field by supervision by CABI, that research organisation I mentioned, um, and has been released at over 50 sites so far with, with good success. Um, and these sites continue to be studied, and through those studies they found that where we have lots of uh, different strains of uh, Himalayan balsam, the rust fungus that you use has to also be specific to where the balsam came from in the first place. So for example, a rust fungus from the Pakistani region of the Himalayas wouldn't have any impact on a, a, a Himalayan balsam plant from the Indian region. Um, and so further research is being undertaken to make sure we have rust funguses for all the different strains of Himalayan balsam that we have in the UK. That's my the first species I wanted to talk about. The second species is another one you may already know, Japanese knotweed. Um, as the name suggests, originally from Japan, um, another ornamental plant that was introduced by the Victorians um, in 1849 and it was naturalized into the wild by the 1880s and the rhizome of this or the root system of this species was actually really attractive to engineers. Um, it, it helps to bind the soils together and so it's been used a lot of times to stabilize embankments which is why you often find this uh, plant on railway embankments, along riverbanks. Um, it just binds the soil and it makes it really stable. It's also found in areas with really uh, nutrient rich soil. They like a high nitrogen concentration. Um, and so the rich riverbanks is a favored habitat. Um, in Watford, you can see Japanese knotweed, um, for example, on the banks of the river in Nutford's playing field. 
although I do recommend caution if you're going to have a look. Um, this, uh, so uh, the key features of this plant, if you are looking, um, is the thick stems that will become really woody as they age. They have a really red um, sort of fleck color to them. Um, and the nodes where on the stem are where the leaves branch off um, and form uh, their leaf stalks. Um, the leaves themselves have a really flat edge. Um, the, they look fairly similar to lime leaves, um, but the, the flat edge is much harsher than a, a lime leaf. Um, and all of that, uh, that plant stems from the rhizomal root system which spreads underground about five to seven meters laterally. Um, possibly, luckily, um, in the UK, we only have the female version of this plant, which means that uh, it can't reproduce by seed. Um, and it will only spread through broken pieces of that rhizome um, or regeneration of broken pieces of the plant. Um, and the, the chance of the plant um, Re regenerating and um, varies depending on which part of the plant is broken off. Um, so if you've broken a piece of the uh, upper stem um, or uh, area joining onto the leaf system, the chance of regeneration is 25 to 30 percent. Um, if it's a lower part of the, the stem, uh, just above the rhizome system, um, then the chance is more like 50%. Um, and then if you're disturbing the rhizome or the root system, the chance of that regenerating is 75 up to 90% chance. So although you can't spread it by, by feed, it can be spread quite easily. Um, and so you should really take care not to disturb any of this plant if you encounter it. Um, so what are the impacts? Why is this an issue? Um, so once again, Japanese knotweed will form a monoculture. Um, so similar to Himalayan balsam, it will reduce the biodiversity of native plants around, surrounding it. Um, and that has a knock-on effect. So that means there's less invertebrates um, around in that area. So there's less predators such as amphibians or birds, reptiles. Um, and so generally it does just decrease the biodiversity in that area. Interestingly, it's also a prized uh, plant species for beekeepers because of its source of nectar. Um, so much so that if you are uh, treating Japanese knotweed, um, it's advised that you notify local beekeepers so that they can keep them away, um, especially if you're treating them with herbicide. Um, economically, because this species can grow through weaknesses, in, in structures, so through cracks in, con cracks in concrete, um, it can cause damage to, to infrastructure. Um, and you might have seen articles about people having issues with mortgages if it was found on your property. Um, this leads to it costing a lot of money um, and it will take a long time to remove. Um, and so it's, it's estimated that Japanese knotweed cost the British economy around 166 million pounds in a year. It's very expensive. Um, like I said, it's extremely difficult to eradicate because bits of just small fragments of the plant are quite likely to regrow. Um, so if you are uh, eradicating, you need to make sure you get all of it. Um, one option to, to remove the plant is to physically remove it, to, to, to excavate and dig it out. This is obviously very expensive. You need the equipment to excavate. You'll be left with a big crater uh, where the knotweed was. Um, in some locations, this isn't particularly feasible, especially by the river. You don't really want to be digging holes next to the river. Um, and then once you've dug the, the plant out, you need to consider what you do with the waste. Um, so you need a, a waste license to dispose of that material because it's you know it's hazardous it's likely to grow again um, and cause issues to others um so it's much easier to do excavation if you've got a small infestation 
but uh, the most commonly used method to control Japanese knotweed is through spraying it with herbicide or stem injecting it with herbicide. And uh, so that must be applied during the growing season, um, in the spring usually, um, so that it's taken down into the rhizome. And then you have to be really careful with the concentration of the herbicide that you're, you're using uh, to ensure the effectiveness, because Japanese knotweed is quite clever. If you put a really high concentration of, of, of herbicide onto its leaves or onto its stem, it recognises the it's under attack and it cuts off supply to that area um, and concentrates its growth on another area where maybe you haven't applied the herbicide. Equally, if you don't apply enough, then it won't have any impact and it will carry on growing anyway. Um, so it's quite a tricky one. Um, it needs repeat, repeated treatment over several years um, to and constantly checking on the progress of that treatment. Because it's so difficult to eradicate, and there's actually been investigation into other uses, um, and there's been consideration whether it could be used as a biofuel um, with fairly mixed success. Um, and then in Japan and China, it's also been used as a medicine, and it's actually shown to have anti-tumor properties. So maybe it's not all bad. Um, I know in Watford, there's a program of work led by the council to treat Japanese knotweed with herbicide, and it's been ongoing for several years with some successes um, and some areas that require herbal treatment. So finally, uh, giant hogweed, um, the, the final species I'm going to talk about, uh, perhaps less common through the centre of Watford, but certainly present on a lot of the tributaries entering the River Colne upstream, um, including parts of the River Ver. And so it's a species to look out for because it is it's around, it could appear at any time. So it's native to the Caucasus Mountains, which is southern Russia and Georgia. Um, again, giant hogweed was first introduced in 1817 by the Victorians, um, where it was uh, really admired for its beauty and its strength. So this plant can reach up to five meters in height. And after three to five years, the flower head can reach up to 80 centimeters across. Um, it actually dies back every year. Um, new growth appears in the, in the springtime. Um, once the plant has flowered, it actually dies back altogether. However, that doesn't mean that that plant is gone. Um, each flower head uh, contains about 50,000 seeds, um, which are viable for up to 15 years. So you may have got rid of one flower head, but there's certainly more to come. Um, it's quite a widely spread plant. It's very adaptable. It's found in lots of places from ornamental gardens to roadsides, riverbanks, railways, woodland fringes, grasslands, fields, woodlands, wastelands, pretty much anywhere. Um, distinctive in identifying this, this species when it is younger, uh, the sharply serrated leaves, um, they're, they're much bigger than the native species of hogweed, and you can see here the, how, how jagged the edges of the leaves are. Um, and then the flower head, as I said, is really rather big um, and really distinctive in, in identifying this plant. Um, because it produces so many seeds, obviously the, there's a high chance of it spreading, but along riverbanks, there's an even higher chance because uh, seeds are carried in the watercourse, um, deposited on banks, and then will continue to grow downstream. <clears throat> and what are the impacts? Um, probably the most shocking photos. Um, the health implications of this species are quite large. Um, so the bristly hairs and the, on the leaves and the skin and the stem of the, the plant can cause a reaction on the skin. It causes blisters and it's actually a chemical burn and um, which reacts repeatedly in sunlight. That's called phytophotodermatitis. Um, the effects of that chemical burn can be felt for years to come and um, whenever your skin is exposed to that sunlight. 
Um, so if you ever come into contact with this species, I fully recommend that you wash the area uh, with soap and cold water and then cover it uh, from sunlight for 48 hours to help try and reduce the effect of that burn. So in addition to that sort of health implication, um, the uh, giant hogweed can also increase soil er erosion in much of the similar way of similar in Boston. It shades out other plants, so there's less ground cover. That means that soils are more likely to be washed away. Uh, there's a less diversity of those other plants around, um, which are unable to grow in those shaded conditions. So more monocultures, more sediment entering the river, and more impact to our native uh, species within the water course itself. Control and management. Um, once again, similar to the last two, it, there's a couple of options. Um, spraying a herbicide in the growing season, between May and March and May, um, will kill off the plant. But because of that large seed bank, this has to be done repeatedly. And then physical um, <coughs> cutting of the of the tap root below ground level will also kill the plant. You can actually pull up younger plants by hand, um, but I fully recommend doing that with lots of PTE to avoid that chemical burn. I've also, <coughs> also found that grazing can be effective, um, as long as you're consistent again. Um, so sheep are really good at keeping the sward short until there are no viable seeds left. Um, and pigs are really good at disturbing the soil and exposing those, those young plants, which actually does kill them off. Um, a fun fact, you may be wondering why the picture of the building. Um, the Victorians actually found that uh, giant hogwood was so beautiful that they it inspired the design of Crystal Palace. Um, and so you can see in the image here, the, the sort of spreading flower head design into the original building. So, there you go. So those are the three uh, species I was gonna talk about. I thought I'd touch a little bit on the legislation. Um, what does the law say about invasive species? Um, the most important piece of legislation is the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, as amended. Um, this bit of legislation is enforced by the police um, uh, and essentially uh, Schedule 14 of the Act makes it illegal to plant or otherwise cause to grow in the wild any plant listed within Schedule 9 of the Act. And Schedule 9 is a list of both animal and plant species um, and that list is regularly reviewed. I I think the latest review was 2015, so I'm sure they're due another one. Um, offences under Schedule 14 um, carry a maximum penalty of a £5,000 fine or up to six months imprisonment. Um, just to note, it's not an offence to have any of those species growing on your land, um, but it is an offence to allow them to spread. So. Um, either to neighbouring land or to the wild. <clears throat> um, the more recent update to this legislation was the ban of sale amendment, um, which was designed to assist the prevention of uh, new introductions. Um, and that list of species is chosen on the merit of invasiveness, uh, where species are known to be highly invasive. Um, it is uh, illegal to sell those species. Um, so that list includes things like uh, water fern, azolla, uh, parrot's feather, uh, floating pennywort, which you may have heard of, uh, floating water primrose, uh, or Ludwigia, um, Australian swamp bone crop, which is crassula. Um, so it's illegal to sell any of those um, plants. So, Despite many initiatives to tackle them, the number of invasive non-native species in the UK and also globally is increasing at an accelerated rate. And this is in direct relationship between the growing globalisation um, and use of freight transport. Um, unfortunately, climate change, um, in addition to this, 
could further expand the range of lots of species, um, particularly warm water species, um, and alter the pathways of freshwater invasion. So this influences the chance of establishment of species, um, aggravates their impact, and then increases the vulnerability of our current native ecosystems. That's not good news. Um, on top of that, um, there are lots of challenges for invasive species management. Um, costs, I've talked a bit about costs. Um, obviously the cost of managing species to start with is quite expensive, but if a species is not uh, managed in any way, that cost will only increase over time. It's obviously very easy to tackle one individual of a species, but much harder to tackle a larger extent if that species has spread. <clears throat> um, because, because the spread of invasive species is linked to the economy, um, it's much harder to stop them being spread in the first place, um, especially as invasives often arrive as companions to trade. Um, so, especially in water, through ship ballast, um, and, and so on. So, it, it's hard to say we must stop these op operations when so many people rely on those operations for their livelihoods. Um, it's also, there's a lot of unknowns about invasive species. Um, it's really impossible to determine exactly the right conditions for an invasion, invasion to occur. And then there's a time lag between when that species arrives in a country and how quickly it becomes a problem species. Um, so yeah, it, it, there's a lot of, <laughs> you, you just can't tell where, where species are coming from next. And we need a lot of vigilance to, to understand any impact. Cooperation, international co cooperation is needed to curb the spread of the species. Um, but local cooperation is needed to then coordinate anything meaningful, any meaningful action uh, on that species. Um, it's obviously no use if you've got one person managing a species in one location, but it's constantly being reintroduced or spread from elsewhere, from upstream. Um, it's a never ending battle. Um, and then finally, education, um, lack of understanding, uh, lack of sharing this kind of knowledge. How can you know if a species is invasive? Um, you might really like that Japanese knotweed in your garden. It's really pretty, there's lots of bees. Um, and if you didn't know that it was invasive, um, why would you do anything? But if you did know it was invasive, what, what should you do about it? How do you, how do you go about that? Um, so, on top of those kind of general challenges for tackling invasives, um, each catchment or area will have their own specific issues. Um, so in the cone in particular, obviously it's a very large area, um, but there's an also, also an awful lot of people. Um, we have at least 12 different local authorities covering the whole of the cone catchment. Um, and then, as I said, we're in the southeast, so the population in this area is, is huge, and there are multiple landowners as a result of that. Um, so knowing who is responsible for an area is a challenge in the first place, um, and how, how much they're responsible for is also difficult to understand. And then that is, issue is obviously exacerbated because different landowners will have their own records, or different boroughs might keep their own records, um, and we need to be able to share data um, or records and, and be up to date with knowledge of where species are um, and where they're spreading to. Um, so without that cooperation and um, prioritization of how invasive species are tackled, um, which species you want to address, where they are and, and how you should do it is increasingly difficult. So the need for an objective is really important to steer any initiative. Are you aiming to prevent the future spread of species? Are you aiming to control the current infestations 
you're looking to completely eradicate a species. Um, and having that goal really helps to drive, you know, the management and how you manage the species in question. Um, we're really lucky in the con catchment. Um, thanks to the Con Valley uh, Fisheries Consultative, um, they developed a, a web page and also an app that we can use to record our species sighting in the field um, and to enable us to check current records of, of where things are. Um, they've actually agreed that this isn't just limited to the con catchment um, and we can use this app or this web page across all the catchments across in Hertfordshire and North London area. And you can use it now. Um, so I really encourage people to, to check that out and take a look um, and add their records as they see different species. Um, so personally, I've used this, this, um, this app um, to record um, records for um, specific initiatives. Um, you may have heard of the Floating Pennywork project on the lower coal. Um, which is now also covering parts of Bullborn. Um, we use the, the app to uh, carry out a yearly survey of where we've seen uh, floating pennywork so that we know where to, uh, whether our management is working um, and whether where we need to concentrate management in the future. So fully recommend using that. Um, if you were to use a web page like this, then um, you also need to have a bit of thought about what you're going to do with all that data. Um, obviously, there's no point in recording for recording's sake, but I would say it's really important that we have a record of, of where our species are so that we know what we can do uh, or what, where we need to concentrate our efforts. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to plug that on and say we should use it. Um, and then finally, what can you do as an individual? Um, something you can all do, whether you can identify uh, an invasive species or not, it's really important that we uh, input some biosecurity into our general day-to-day -day activities. Um, so we spent the last three years washing our hands. That's great. Um, what about washing our boots? Um, so biosecurity simply means keeping your kit clean um, around watercourses and waterways, and it, well, and it can apply not just to watercourses, um, anywhere really where you think there's um, an ecologically sensitive area. Um, and it applies to anything from your waders to your fishing rods to your boots. Um, <clears throat> and essentially it's just a case of three simple steps. Check, check your kit is clean. Um, if it's not clean, clean it. Um, that's the second step. Um, remove any sort of organic matter, any mud, um, any, any rubbish that you might have on that. Um, wash it with water. You can also get a disinfectant, something called Vercon, which is really great at um, uh, sort of um, destroying um, pathogens and disease. Um, and then finally, dry. Dry everything out before you use it again at another site. Um, and if you do those things, it really helps to improve uh, or decrease the chance of species being spread across our waterways. Um, I can share a link to the non-native species secretariat guidance on, on biosecurity. It's definitely something I recommend for any volunteer groups, any angling societies. I really, it's a really great idea to include that in your day-to-day -day activities near the watercourse. Um, so, that's everything from me. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was engaging. I hope it was useful or new. Um, and if not, I hope it was a good recap of, of some of the species we see in, us in, in Watford. Um, I think we're doing questions now. If um, you don't have any questions now, but um, you think of some after this, please feel free to send me an email um, and I can pass on any questions to Maria if it's a bit more environment agency specific. Um, hi, it's Sandy. Uh, I've, I've got a few things that I wouldn't mind saying. Um, to, to start with, um, 
we've got the Kashmiri strain of uh, of balsam in the cone catchment, and we cabbie have had seeds from us for for many years, but we 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 didn't have the um, rust spot variant. But they believe they've got it now, and they're in the process of of testing seeds from um, from Frogmore Pits on the Ver and um, Watford. So hopefully um, we'll we'll get a result from from that, which would be good. But then obviously it's going to be important that we um, we have an area that we can uh, release uh, rust spot, and uh, we don't have people balsam bash just after <laughs> we've uh, <laughs> we've released the rust spot. So so that was one. There's there's maybe light at the end of the tunnel, and and probably we we look at uh, headwaters. It would make sense the headwaters um, on the ver and on, on the cone. Um, uh, Maybe at the end, Maria, orange balsam. I'm seeing orange balsam everywhere now. Um, last year, I wasn't sort of focusing on it, but now I'm just seeing it <laughs> really, you know, that there's just tons of it um, on, on the cone coming, coming down. So that's one that, um, that I feel like this year I'm, I'm going to focus on. But it's Schedule 9, but, but then, isn't it? It is Schedule 9, orange balsam. Um, Maria? Uh um, I, I'm actually not, I don't think it, it is, but um, I think maybe it should be. <laughs> it's a, well, it's, it's a non-native invasive species anyway, isn't it? So, yeah, so, but, but yeah, so I, I feel like, you know, we, we should be focusing on that as well. Um, just in relation to Japanese knotweed, um, uh, they, uh, Monsanto uh, produced a report showing that uh, whilst generally we go for, for spraying or injection at senescence, which is when it's pulling all the nutrients back into its root ball, so at the end of summer, um, they have produced a report which shows that actually summer spraying, so June, July, once the foliage is established, can be as effective as, as um, senescence, and you can actually do both. So you could do a, a June, July spray or injection and then, then a late spray. Um, but um, where, where you've got bonsai regrowth, Florum is saying that what they're gonna do is they're gonna wait until it's regrown before they treat it again. So I, I thought that was, that was interesting. And the other thing to consider is, is when it's flowering, try to avoid spraying during the day when it's flowering, just to um, avoid a, the, the damage to bees and, and, and other insects that, that are using the plant. Um, then you, you mentioned uh, giant hogweed. Um, you, you said treatment uh, March to May. Uh, that, that probably is a bit early. You, you want the foliage to have developed. Obviously, with giant hogweed, it becomes very big very quickly, but you want the foliage to be fully developed. So I'm, I'm waiting until June before I spray off stuff, um, and that's, that's what was recommended to me. Uh, March, you're not going to have any growth, or you're going to have very small growth, so you wouldn't bother spraying in, in March because there wouldn't be anything there. Um, and then when you're digging out, I definitely, um, rather than ideally, if you can dig out the root without disturbing the soil too much because it's it's that balance between you disturb the soil and you're helping the seeds to generate but if you if you just cut it um you've got the the root ball is quite often the size of a small football so if you're just cutting it below you can get regrowth and i've found that so there's there's a, a point um in relation to that um and and i guess just also to say that um that whilst we talk about seed banks and and we i believe him Himalayan balsam, whilst it can be anything uh, up to four or five years, seeds lose their vitality year on year. So I'm seeing loads of year two regrowth, which I, I thought, you know, last year there wasn't any, um, there weren't any uh, balsam plants flowering in an area, seeding in an area, and yet we've got regrowth. So we know that there's that, but then with, with um, uh, giant hogweed, whilst the seed bank does last longer than, than the Himalayan balsam, still you'd imagine that year on year seeds will lose vitality. So it's not like, you know, you, you, you're gonna have the, the same amount, but you do need to go back and check. And um, I'm still waiting on a, a letter from the Environment Agency that we can send to landowners to, um, to let them know that they have a responsibility to treat invasive species. That's something we talked about some time ago, and that, that could be useful for reluctant uh, landowners. Because, um, yeah, I mean, from my understanding is that the number of prosecutions um, for, uh, for allowing invasive species to spread, well, I know of one, yeah, 
um and that was uh, that was over in in essex and um yeah so yeah that but we we could do with something to remind landowners that that they do have a responsibility um so yeah that that was it from me okay thanks for that sandy um tony do you still have uh, i know your hand was raised do you have any questions yeah i took it down in anticipation if we're going to get tired because i knew sandy was talking <laughs> 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 Sorry, Sandy. <laughs> um, just <clears throat> excuse me. Um, apologies for being late getting in as well because uh, I'm having, I'm having all sorts of IT problems today. So, um, thanks for that, Maria. You you were talking about kind of um, the, the legalities in terms of somebody it not being illegal to have plants growing on their ground, but obviously in terms of it spreading, we know it is. I've never been quite clear on how that impacts somebody that's got a new third to float in Penny Walk because this is the, the main one for, 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 for you know behind this question. What happens if somebody's got it growing on a stretch of river that they own? When I say they own, because I presume it's the bed of the river that they own, and then it can kind of obviously spread off from, from there. So what's the situation around that? Yeah. So it's an interesting one. It's a tricky one as well, um, because a plant may just appear, um, but how do you know who put it there in the first place? So it's kind of like, where do you apportion the blame to? And that that's the kind of initial issue with why we don't know where exactly, well, we might know where exactly posting penny work come from, but how do we prove that is the, that's why there's so few prosecutions on um, invasives being uh, spread illegally. Um, you kind of have to prove that they've uh, some, someone in particular has put that there um, where it wasn't there before. Um, and so that's why record keeping is you know really important. So if you can prove that there, there was nothing there before, now there is, that's great. But then you have to say who put it there. Um, and how do you prove that they put it there? Did you see them? Did you not see them? Um, is it just hearsay? Um, so that, that therein lies the problem of getting the prosecution. So with Floating Pennywhere, um, I, I think I know what you're thinking about, probably on the Vulvorn. Um, we don't know where exactly it came from. We don't know who put it there. Um, so how do we know who to prosecute in the first place? Um, in terms of allowing it to spread, um, I think that's where the reminders of people's responsibilities comes in. Um, and uh, Sandy rightly said that I do have a letter that we can share with people to remind them of that responsibility. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's one that, so the Wildlife and Countryside Act is enforced by the police, but um, you might imagine that the police have other issues on their minds. Um, and so it's it's really hard to to follow through with that kind of prosecution unless it's on a really big scale. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But oh yeah, kind kind of, and 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 you know, and obviously partly in my mind was what's happening with the ball ball area that we we both looked at. But actually, it's a, it's a question that has been raised much much earlier than that before ever we had the, the infection up there. And I think I think where the difference is with the river and, and, and the rivers flowing water in Pennywall is that yeah it kind of you know I mean the argument would be is it's appeared on somebody's stretch of river because it's come down from, from downstream invariably and therefore arguably somebody else is in it soon but the, 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 the issue with it is that unless they actually take active um, you know an active measure to remove that during the course of the year then it is an absolute given that as it starts to break up come the autumn time that it will then flow off so just almost by taking no action um, mm. still determines that it's going to that, that it's going to spread further down the catchment and it, it it was it was kind of around that that the original questions come up is you know mm. is it acceptable for somebody just basically to ignore it's there and let it let it do its thing later in the year and then consequently that's spreading it further down the catchment um but yeah so that you know as you say it's a complicated one and, and, and i guess it probably was but i wanted to make sure there wasn't anything more of a um a kind of definitive answer on it now clearly not 
no no sorry <laughs> no it's um i think it comes back to that education again though because if, if you don't know that it's invasive how do you know it how do you know it's invasive you know how do you know yeah. what you don't know <laughs> um yeah so i guess with the floating penny way that's why part of that project was about education and getting volunteers involved and i i like to think that a lot of people in the lower coal now know exactly what floating penny what is and they might think to pick it out if they're nearby um but yeah it's it's uh tricky <laughs> as another species i didn't talk about so i thought it might uh be something that we could go on for ages but i suppose i should highlight that it's one that might appear in watford in um the, if you are interested i'm happy to talk about it <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Maria. So any other questions from anyone? If not, we'll wrap up and go to the last slide. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, this lunchtime. I hope you found it interesting, informative. It was very detailed and it covered all, all the key and basic species, which I think was really good. Um, so um, please keep in touch. Um, if you're not already signed up to our programme e-newsletter or sign up to be a volunteer, you can visit these website links, which I'll also be sending in a follow-up email. Um, but please come to other events that we have. We have plenty coming up in May um, in the rest of the month. Um, but apart from that, Thank you for coming and hopefully we will see you soon at another event.